Um, this is Matchmaker Matchmaker Part 2. I'm Karen Knox, the Director of Vendor Relations, and we really appreciate you joining us today. We decided to offer this Matchmaker series of conversations because we know the strong supply chains and trusting collaborative supplier-retailer relationships are critical to the success of your company. If you are successful, then the industry will also be more successful. And that's one of our core values at VDB. Thanks again, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. So allow me to please introduce our lovely panelists. Um, we have Robbie and Jeff from Naples Jewelry in Wichita Falls. Um, Robbie has been with Naples for 12 years, but she's been in the industry for 25 years. She's their operations manager. <clears throat> And Jeff is a fourth generation jeweler and his store has been open there in Wichita Falls for 130 years. So pretty incredible. Then we have Kevin Vantahen. Kevin is from Vantahen Diamonds in uh, Toronto, outside of Toronto, Canada. And um, he is second generation and his family is, uh, his parents are from Belgium. Um, a lot of you might know Kevin from the Young Diamond Tears group. He's very active and vocal, so very glad to have him here as well. We also have Benjamin King, who's with Venus in the US. Benjamin has been in the industry and with Venus for over 20 years. We were just marveling at how quickly 20 years goes by and how young we also look after 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, great, and then um, we have Akshay Shah, also from Venus, and he is in charge of uh, sales for Venus. Um, he has also been with Venus for over 20 years. And we have Dylan Berkowitz from Blauweiss Berkowitz. Uh, they are a retailer in New York on 47th Street. So they are a third generation retailer, but fourth generation in the industry. And then some of you may see we have Holly on mute below. Um, Holly is going to be our technical person. So I'd like you all to take a look, um, make sure that you let us know, type any questions that you have, like if you have a hard time connecting or hearing us, please write that in the webinar chat and uh, Holly will help you out. So, um, and then also there's a Q&A at the bottom I wanna point out. Um, you can take a look at that. And then Holly um, will be vetting those questions for us. Um, so the first 40 minutes, ideally, we'll see how it goes. The first 40 minutes mm -hmm. will be a discussion among everyone. And then the last 20 minutes will be the Q&A. So feel free to go ahead and pose questions during the first 40 minutes. And again, Holly will be going through those at the last 20. All right, so last week's discussion, um, it, it went really well. We went over time and people had a lot of questions. So clearly we believe there's a lot of value uh, between getting suppliers and retailers together and having a very open and honest discussion. I want this to feel like we're all sitting around the table having coffee and very friendly. I think that's very important. The feedback that we provide should be very constructive for the panelists and also for all of you listening in with us today. Um, so one of the questions that I wanted to start off with is just pretty open. I want to understand the pain points that um, each of you feel that you have working with the other side. So if you're a retailer, you know, what are your pain points or things that you, know, you wanna make sure that you share? I wanna start off with that item. Um, Robbie and Jeff, would you like to start? Sure, why not? Absolutely. So we're talking about what what are you said our pain point is. Yeah, like when you thought about joining today and you're thinking about what information you would like to share, or what questions you want to pose from the suppliers, what is the most pressing issue or um, pain point I, that you have? Okay, I, I'm kind of in a, an odd position because I was raised very, very old school, you know, my, my grandfather was uh, from the Middle East and, and how we learned to do business was very, very relational. So mm -hmm. it, it, in a very current day for diamond buying, it's about 
wrap and price and sheet and what's available and stuff. I grew up with know the person you're buying from, shake hands across the table, how those relationships mm -hmm. supersede what's on a wrap sheet or what's on paper. So um, if, if I were to have one highlight as a, as a retailer, the value of the person that we deal with is paramount. The, mm -hmm. the integrity, the connection, the relationship. And I think it's become second to price, unfortunately, where it's uh, just about whoever has the cheapest wins the game. And I think that's become a mistake. It needs to be, you know, the relationships you build need to be build a stronger, stronger tie. So if, if I, my pain cycle would be a little bit is if I could, if I had a, again, a banner to wave to all retailers is if you don't build the relationship with your vendors, you're just price hunting. You're just searching for a stone. So uh, some of our relationships go back decades and decades with people. And mm -hmm. um, I want to build, and that's hard when vendors are calling and, and we're having conversations with people. It's just about price instead of who are you as a vendor? What are your values? What do you stand for? Why do you do what you do? Why are you even in this game? So that's, that's my little highlight for the, my feelings. Excellent, excellent. All right, um, Dylan, on the retail side. Um, well, I'd like to piggyback off what Jeff was saying. I think that's a tremendous point. Um, retailers spend a lot of time cultivating relationships with mm -hmm. our clients getting to know them on a personal level, chit-chatting, spending quality time with them, and establishing that trust and relationship. Um, I feel, not with all, but many wholesalers, mm -hmm. there is a disconnect there with we don't feel that same sense from them as we are giving to our clients. So I think that creates a great opportunity because especially with, you know, RapNet, VDB, um, it's a great way to connect, but it does just become paramount of price instead of relationship. So if they step in, mm -hmm. introduce themselves, call us, personalize the relationship, make us want to buy from them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's plenty of retailers, especially where I work on 47th Street. <laughs> so, and we sell very similar products. So why do we get business over someone else? Because simply the, the client wants to buy from us. So that's a great opportunity for wholesalers to kind of step in and establish themselves as a relationship there. Right. That's a source of differentiation. And that, I think that was a big takeaway from our conversation last week was that the concept of this matchmaker is, again, what I would say is that we are the matchmaker, but you still have to go on the date. And that reinforces how important that relationship is between the retailers and suppliers. Um, this isn't a replacement for doing business. This is supposed to enable you to better do business more efficiently, right? Um, Kevin, what would you like yeah, to add? Um, well, those are, those are great points, uh, Jeff and Dylan mentioned. And I think actually to, to, to reverse that as well, um, I get retailers that sometimes it's, are you the cheapest on the list? Uh, what's your wrap discount? And so, I mean, obviously it's up to me to try to, uh, you know, express the value, more of the value that I can give. I might not be the cheapest on the list, but, uh, you know, to try mm -hmm. to build that relationship. So on the reverse side, there's, there's some of those as well. And that's sometimes tough, you know, that they're just price shopping and rightfully mm -hmm. so. Um, they have to do the best and work the hardest for their uh, clients and customers and totally understand that. And, um, but obviously, yeah, it's trying to uh, come across as giving the value and, and it's just not always about the price. Price is important, but uh, there's a lot of other pieces of the pie. Um, but another note as well is, um, is communication. Communication is, uh, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can. Um, and so if there's clear communication back and forth, things can get done very quickly. Uh, I can service them um, the best I can. And so sometimes when that's uh, not apparent on the other side, it can be tough to uh, do my job as well. So um, I would say communication is, is pretty important. Excellent, excellent. And um, Akshay or Benjamin, either one of you, 
what input would you like to share? So uh, definitely Kevin and Jeff has said uh, this is very important that you know we are dealing the whole diamond industry and the jewelry industry is quite on the basis of trust and uh, transparency. So for example, times like these, when if you have relationship with your vendor or your retailer, you can really communicate that I'm stuck here and these are the things and you know, it's just mm -hmm. not the price point buying. So which really helps each other to grow and overcome situations like these where you really need each other's support. And as Kevin said, communication is very important. Sometimes some retailers, we send the stones on memo, they might uh, take a week or they might take two weeks. Their appointments get delayed and things happen. But if we are not well communicated, there is always an anxiety that what's going to happen. And you know, the retailer is replying on the stone, he's working, not working. So it's very important to be prompt and compassionate communication in today's where communication is there you can just text be on you know phone mail call so the world is quite connected and you know this is something very important to build a relationship so completely go with that Ben you want to add something yeah I would say for pain points for the mm -hmm. site holder side um, we tend to be try to be as proactive as possible through the manufacturing process um, reactive to um, retailers' demands and wholesalers' demands. Mm -hmm. I, I think what a lot of people don't understand is we have a very large toolbox. Any is trying to achieve in their... Ben, I think you're cutting out Everything from manufacturing. Hello, Ben. Ourselves to bring in a cohesive message of what they want to sell in diamonds works really well. So sorry, Ben, it sounds like a bit of uh, your message got cut off, um, but you were talking about just the big toolbox that Venus has and sending a cohesive message to, uh, to the buyers. Yeah, so that message, you know, the toolbox that we have is the manufacturing scale, the Mm -hmm. supply the sourcing you know for some people it is the um canada or south africa or whatever that is um technologies and cutting with faceting um some people are really into the um ags asset zero all those tools that we have are available to every retailer we find mm -hmm. those retailers that dial into those um into that toolbox and create a mm -hmm. program do very, very well with us, margin becomes less of the issue and it's more about us helping them reinforce the message that they're trying to push into their respective markets. All right, very good. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, again, I think we are reinforcing the importance of communication. Um, you know, and sometimes I think that seems really obvious, but if anything, I think last week showed that it's not obvious because we get called up in our day to day and we forget how important it is to pick up the phone call or leverage technology to improve our relationship again, not to replace it. Um, so when we're thinking about other pain points that we would like to discuss and throw out there, um, you know, Akshay or Ben, in terms of pain points, um, you mentioned the communication of um, everything that Venus offers, but, you know, where do you find that disconnect? And, you know, I think this is a bigger message for, for you also, Kevin, how are you communicating your value add to help remove the price and the margin discussion as being the priority? You know, how do you reinforce your messaging and the value that you bring to the table? Uh, to me or Ben or Either one of you, either one. I mean, just, I mean, I guess uh, you kind of follow the lead of the, the retailer or the jeweler, but uh, you know, part of what we do uh, is I'm a couple days in my office, but the other days during the week, I'm out in stores and seeing them face to face mm -hmm. um, and just offering those services. So, I mean, 
yes, it takes a bit of time. Uh, but I think that, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing that now. Uh, the face of FaceTime is really important um, to gain that trust relationship um, mm -hmm. and for them to understand um, what we do. I mean, sometimes you have to wait long enough uh, that maybe they were unhappy with a, another supplier or something like that, and you're able to come <laughs> in and help them uh, save the day and then show that you're really there to work for them. And I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that is part of it. And, and so sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. It takes some time. And um, mm -hmm. I remember working a, a city for a while and it took quite a few years, uh, but they saw me consistently, um, you know, a couple times a year. I respected their time, made appointments, uh, tried to show them the value I could create. Um, and so, yeah, it takes some time, but uh, I think eventually, you know, uh, when they do see it, uh, you're able to, to work with them that way. So, um, I think, yeah, face to face and in the stores is something I, uh, that we work very hard at. Mm -hmm. Very good. And Ben, I mean, Ben's in the U S I know I've seen Akshay travel a lot. <laughs> I've seen him in <laughs> India and, and outside. Um, you know, how do you really facilitate getting your message across? Ben, you would like to start? No, take it away, actually. <laughs> so, uh, basically, you know, it's uh, a set cabin and, you know, Jeff, we all agree on that, that it's a relationship and it takes time to build up. Sometimes, you know, for example, as a manufacturer, we are into high value diamonds and one stone mm -hmm. is valuing 50000 dollars $100,000, $200,000 stone. And a retailer mm -hmm. might have a client to show to their client and they request for a stone, but that's quite a new contact. So maybe they are established in their country and uh, in the region, they are very good. But uh, sometimes we have to take some references. So sometimes mm -hmm. uh, people get offended that, you know, don't you know me, who I am, you can ask anywhere, but you know, it's, I think two way because, you know, when we are giving the stone worth hundred thousand dollar, it's kind of, of lending, you know, if a Rolex, I mean, you know, you have to send money and you get the delivery after eight months, but the model is different in diamond luxury as a product because, you know, you need to trust each other and you have to supply. So uh, we try to overcome that by communicating and, you know, getting the references and, you know, but sometimes uh, there is an hesitation from the retail and that, uh, you know, you can ask, but I don't need to do this. So, you know, it's, it's just not that there is a distrust, but it's just understanding mm -hmm. each other. So yeah, that is absolutely one thing. And uh, there is no offense and, you know, we can meet halfway is that, you know, sometimes they also have to trust us by, you know, 50% deposit or we give them because, you know, every stone is, is big time in value. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that that's my uh, kind of pain point, which I can share with. And in what ways do you take references? What references do you usually consider valid? How many references do you normally get? So generally two or three people's reference is enough. And uh, mm -hmm. in today's world, uh, if anyone is in any part of the world, it's not that difficult. Basically, mm -hmm. you can uh, find the people in that city or that country, or they can find uh, that, okay, I have a supplier in Mumbai, you can ask them, you know, or India, or I have a, a you know, New York people like this. So mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty simple. It's uh, just you know, have to have more patience and more dialogues before actually the transaction happens. So right. um, it, it, it's not uh, that rocket science or it's not that complicated to get references, but yeah, it, it, uh, you know, in initial way, you, you have to submit certain information, which, you know, as uh, you know, vendor we might ask for. So that, that's, right. uh, that's it. But that is a standard procedure. Um, you're not asking for anything out of line. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I agree with you. Us retailers, we need to suck it up. If we're going to ask for a stone and you don't know us, we need to supply it. And, you know, some people get all tied up and worked up over it. If you pay your bills on time and you're responsible, you need yeah. to give references. So uh, as, a, as speaking for retailers, we need to be more... Um, we need to be more open about references and about, cause you're the one taking the risk. So we, we need to be better about that as, as a whole community. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, there was some of that um, last week, and I appreciate the level of ownership taken on both sides about things that you know retailers need to work on, suppliers need to work on. Um, but you know, I also handle new users for VDB, so you know, I try. You know, I'm vetting the new users, and when I ask for references, I, I have to say sometimes I'm a little surprised because it seems like. Um, they're not familiar with the process of providing references, and I don't know if that should be a sign to me that I need to vet them a little more because I, I'm aware that they need to have references when they're uh, reaching out for goods, right? Um, Dylan, since you're on 47th Street, I mean, I think that for you, one, you're very visible. You have a lot of suppliers at your fingertips. Um, what is the experience for you in working with a new supplier and having to get that credit or provide those references? Um, yeah, so the experience is fine. It's more like a numbers game. Like we're treated as a number, they're treated as a number, which I think there's room for improvement. But, mm -hmm. you know, personally, I completely respect them asking for references. I'm happy to provide as many as they'd like, you know, because of where I am, I also do a touch of wholesale. So I understand the risk involved. Mm -hmm. So um, references are just part of doing business, you know, like actually I said, 50,000, $100,000 stone, you have to be protected. Otherwise it's not worth the risk. So we're more than happy to provide that um, anytime someone is. And so um, availability of references on the retailer side, um, you know, are the people that you reach out to to provide references, do you find that they're helpful when you need to provide one? What's that experience like? I mean, both of you have been in business for a long time. You have a lot of established relationships. Um, so I would think it might be rather easy for both Nakels and Blauweiss Berkowitz to provide references. But, you know, when you're, you're thinking about your own experience and also, you know, I want to make sure that we're addressing some of the other stores, perhaps smaller stores, um, perhaps newer stores um, who are looking to build up cr credit and need to get references. Um, what, what is that process like and what advice might you offer them? Well, if it's a new business and they don't have that established um, business or, or references that they can give out, I know that I felt more comfortable taking perhaps partial payment from someone uh, on a memo term, just to kind of leverage the loss perhaps, if not all of it, if it's really in, in the beginning stages of their business. Um, I think just a open and honest dialogue is, is the best recipe for this. Mm -hmm. We're all human at the end of the day and we can understand each other's perspectives. And I think we can both bend a little bit to, to make the sale happen. Yep. What about you, Jeff and Robbie? Like, are you, um, again, I'm sure it's rather easy for you to provide references, but when, you know, you're talking to other retailers and they're telling you, oh, my reference didn't respond right away and those kind of things, you know, what suggestions do you offer? Wow, um, actually it's hard because because we submit references, we, we do whatever it takes, JPT, we try to stay current with just to make it easier for people. But I, I do, I, I'm in a hard position to know what it'd feel like to be a new store, to be the new guy or a younger guy or younger girl going into this business with, without the, that, uh, that background. So it's, it's a little remote for me to try to wrap around my head around it. Yep. Um, so perhaps for the suppliers, uh, this is something I know I asked last week, but would love your perspective. Um, when you're working with a newer retailer or someone who's perhaps having a hard time providing references, you know, are you working with them by doing exactly what Dylan mentioned? Perhaps they're going to put 50% uh, up front. You know, how do you work with them? Are you actively engaging? And I think this goes to how important it is to develop new relationships and how willing we are to work for those new relationships 
on that note, I will just let you know, I actually have some suppliers tell me they don't need new buyers, which is absolutely fascinating. I think that's, that means they're doing a fabulous business. Um, but at the end of the day, I think most of us would like new customers as well and need to build those relationships. So how willing are you to work with new people and you know, how do you navigate that to make sure you are building those new relationships? Yeah, I guess I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I know with some of the newer stores that are, you know, there's some newer designers coming up and yeah, mm -hmm. literally I'll send them the application and there's, you know, the references are not very solid um, or nothing I can mm -hmm. really go on. But uh, I think it's, you know, part of maybe what uh, suppliers do is, I mean, feeling out people. It's again, you know, chatting with them on the phone seeing, I mean, even their websites or Instagram, I mean, that does help a little bit to see if they're active, uh, mm -hmm. if they're part of any organizations. Uh, and again, mm -hmm. communication back and forth, um, you know, what they're after. And of course, there is a little bit of, uh, you know, slow and steady, right? So I think a lot of the newer, younger ones coming in, uh, they understand this. I mean, they're really hoping yeah. a supplier will put some trust into them and you can kind of feel that and and that's i know I, i've learned that from my father and us too you know you, you just get a feeling about some people you know some you just have a feeling and you have to walk away which is not easy <laughs> uh it's very hard uh we all want to say yes and sell right uh <laughs> yeah but uh and then there's ones where you're like i really hope i can help them out and i'll take a bit of a chance i mean uh, mm -hmm. part of our business is uh is a risk management i think we're we're a little bit more adverse to risk. So uh, if you can kind of put a few pieces of the puzzle together, uh, take those easy first steps, you know, see how fast they get back to you. Uh, you know, did they tell you on Monday, hey, I sold the goods or I didn't, or actually I had a new one just uh, two weeks ago. He's, he's a bit more fresh. And I think before he even got the memo goods, he was like, well, Kevin, what's the total of the price? And uh, can I get, send you a check right away? And I'm like, wow, okay, that's, that, that, those are some good uh, signs to see right away, right? So, absolutely. Um, and then on the other note, I, you know, me being in Canada, I've, I've sold a little bit into the States and, and uh, Japan and Europe and some other areas. And yeah, I mean, that, that takes a little bit more uh, communication, a little bit more time uh, to, to maybe get, get through some of those humps and uh, to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think in some of those cases, you know, I, I do take a little bit of uh, uh, funds up front before we ship. And, and mm -hmm. I, you know, 99% of stores, I mean, they're so willing to give references. They want to do business. We want to do business. So they're not going to try to hold things up if they really want to uh, work with you. So that's, that's my experience. Great. Akshay or Ben? Yeah, I would like to add some things uh, like we had some situations like these uh, some stones in london welling half million dollars or even in australia we sold a stone two hundred and fifty thousand dollar pretty new uh, retail and they had first time call like that in fact for them also it was a new business so it was wow. a unique situation and you know we do regular business of ten twenty thousand dollars but the value is like this big and even we understand retail situation. So we tried to ask them and we sent the photos, videos, and we discussed a lot for 15 days. And then they convinced their client that the stone can come. You need to pay half deposit kind of thing because it's a high value store. So they send us this uh, half value amount. And then we ship the stone to their countries. They, it was with Malka Amit or Brinks on hold. And then the consumer and the retailer went there they saw the stone and then, you know, they all agreed that the stone is proper. Everything is good. This is what exactly they're looking for. And mm -hmm. then they send the balance amount and we got paid. So there are solutions. Basically, as Kevin said, it's, it's communication. You know, there are new opportunities even for some new businesses, but they have potential to develop. So we need to have patience, try to work from our end. Even they try. And I think, as he said, uh, most of the time, it works. I mean, you know, so this, this can be handled. Right. Ben, go ahead. So, you know, obviously when I'm thinking about who I want to be on the panel, I'm looking for people who I think 
use best practices for their respective businesses. And you know, part of the reason that it's important that you share what you do is because I think you also set an example for others in the industry. Um, you know, for those, let's say I'm going to pick on suppliers for a minute. Those suppliers who perhaps are um, less patient, you know, what would you say to them about being um, taking the time to actually form those relationships? Would you say, please don't and we'll have the business? Or, you know, what would, <laughs> Kevin's nodding. Um, you know, what would you say to them? This is really um, an opportunity for, again, for us to share what are those best practices? Because at the end of the day, I think those best practices help everyone. I can jump in on that if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I think best practices for, each and every business, they have a different model on what their message is in their store. Conveying that um, message to the manufacturer allows us the time to be able to um, source the right material, cut it and deliver it in the price ranges that they need it for. Um, we generally try not to be reactive. Um, we tend to be very proactive with our um, retailers that we deal with. So, you know, memo call is definitely a a sizable part of the business, but the majority of our business is really focused, regardless of the size of the retailer, really we try and target those retailers that say, this is what I need for my store to be successful because internet retailers are just doing price and GIA reports. We prefer to go into something a little bit more specific because our staff loves to sell fancies. Our st staff mm -hmm. loves to sell, you know, triple X hearts and arrows with 53 to 55% tables, whatever those, um, you know, parameters are manufacturers mm -hmm. like us, we jump into those relationships with two feet and really do our best to support them. So um, on the one off calls, like everybody's talking about here, we all have to do that. But we really encourage mm -hmm. the retailers, think strategically about what that diamond portfolio looks like and let us help you um, keep that in stock at the right prices. That's a great point. Okay. Um, Dylan, what kind of, you have an interesting perspective, first of all. You said that you, we know you're a retailer on 47th, but you do a little wholesale because of where you are. Um, so that gives you a, a nice, unique perspective. I think being growing up on 47th Street is certainly a, a nice perspective as well. Um, from your side, what do you see is one of the bigger issues between retailers and suppliers that you think would be important to address? Um, well, I think one area of opportunity is, and Benjamin kind of touched upon this, is the resources that these wholesalers have. They have amazing mm -hmm. inventories and technologies. And in the changing retail world, foot traffic, uh, especially in New York City, is down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of opportunities through social media. So mm -hmm. if we can coordinate with wholesalers to get new content, for them to perhaps mm -hmm. bring some down for us this is so convenient and we can do some creative content to showcase it to all of our followers to email our customers just to be a little bit more proactive um i think there's great mm -hmm. uh, area there for us to to seize yep so i think being proactive in your communication is absolutely a takeaway from today and also for last week um so since I do work for VDB, I would like to hear how we, how each of you, so all of us leverage technology, whether it's VDB or sending out emails to customers, how do you leverage technology to strengthen those relationships instead of using technology as a way to decrease your connectivity? Um, again, it's not meant to replace right? Your relationships, it's meant to enhance. So how do you do that? Jeff, what do you say? This is your specialty. <clears throat> um, okay, so to, like I use VDB, I use mm -hmm. it for a little bit, but sometimes there would be diamonds that you would, 
I would send to somebody I had a relationship with and that diamond wouldn't be available. So it just gets kind of frustrating because you're like shopping mm -hmm. through trying to, and really, you know, we've all touched on relationships are important. I train the staff to be able to order their own diamonds in and relationships become mm -hmm. important to them too. Cause whoever makes it m more easier or who, who becomes their favorite is who they call first. <laughs> so, you know, that's, we're all about relationships. It's kind of like on two, two sides, you know, in order mm -hmm. for us to get the business on the front side, we have to build relationships with the client, but it's just as important on the back side. And, you know, I like that Kevin said he goes to stores and, you know, we've mm -hmm. had training sessions and, and it just, it, it builds more than just about stone and price. And so the, the thing about VDB is you have this ocean of diamonds that does put it down to price, but I look for relationships first because I can call them up and say, tell me, you know, really about this diamond, you know? So mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that's, that's important. Um, and that it's available. And then there's some diamonds that we, you know, we don't even know if we can get in. So. Yeah. So I think that also goes back to just a reminder to our suppliers how important it is to keep your stock updated. Um, I know BDB, we chase our suppliers um, to make sure that they're updating inventory. We let them know if there's changes to inventory, um, you know, so that we make sure that the experience for our retailers is optimal. We want to make sure that you know if the stone's available or not without, um, you know, having to pick up the phone. Um, because it is frustrating when our retailers call a supplier and something's not available. So again, it's the technology is not a replacement. It, it should be there to help. So it's important to ensure that the information's there to help Robbie and her staff make those sales. Um, no, that's great. Thank you, Robbie. Kevin? Yeah, um, those are great points. I mean, I think definitely the, the starting block is, you know, uh, the relationships that you do have that you have those lists of stones and you're, you know, you have those three or four suppliers on VDB that you know you can go to. Uh, and, and, and so the technology is a great starting block, uh, you know, if you're narrowing it down to a couple of characters that you're looking for, you know that these two or three suppliers have the quality and the size you're after. And then I think then, I mean, that enhances the, the kind of the starting of that. And, and then it's after, you know, afterwards, it's like Robbie was saying is then uh, calling up and saying, Hey, do you, is the stone actually available or it's out on memo? I can get it back tomorrow and mm -hmm. back out to you. Uh, you know, wh where is the inclusion on the stone, even though, you know, VDB and, and with the 10 power magnification looks great. Um, you know, to the naked eye is actually what, you know, the person is wearing on their finger. Right. So uh, right. there's some explaining to do there. So, I mean, it's definitely uh, an enhancer and I find it's, it's a, just a good way to start. And then, and then hopefully you have those relationships that you can kind of finally uh, kind of settle on a few stones and get those in for your, your clients, uh, like Robbie was saying. Excellent. Okay, Dylan. Um, yeah, I think that it is a great tool to enhance communication, VDB and these technologies. Um, I think to kind of further the communications, I think retailers would like to know not only if the stone is actually available in real time, but also a little bit more about the policies of a wholesaler, especially if it's a new wholesaler. Yep. If we sell the sell stone and it comes back, will you take it back? If so, mm -hmm. refund the money, is there a credit? If they trade it up years down the line, will you do so? Things mm -hmm. like that. You know, as retailers, we relay this information to our clients. You know, we offer trade ups and things like that. So mm -hmm. if we know a wholesaler will do that, or even worse, if a wholesaler is willing to do that and we don't know that, um, that's, you know, that's a problem. Yeah, so we should agree. Use these tools to really communicate better um, and understand each other's policies better. Yep. Yeah, it feels like, you know, if it's not going to be about price, it's got to be about perks. So <laughs> what kind of perks do you have? Because that's, if you want to get away from price, that's what you sell. And some of our suppliers will, you know, ship, you know, FedEx both ways. And so there's no risk. But I do my job on my side to make sure that the sales staff is pre-qualifying the customer. Because obviously, we just don't want to play in diamonds all day, you know. 
but the perks matter, like, you know, upgrades or trade-ins or divorces, you know, they want to get a different diamond because they don't, you know, they have a diamond that they bought. That's, that's huge perks. Excellent. Um, maybe, maybe Dylan and Robbie, what, do you like to see that in a written policy ahead of time? Is that something that you've seen or, you know, to lay those things out to discuss? Some people do have a written policy about it and it just helps. If we're going to sell a, a two and a half carat DIF heart shape, we don't want to eat that again on the trade in. No. And I know you don't want to eat that no. again on the trade in. But if it comes up, if it makes the sale, say, hey, you know what? If next shop is in the next job is a four carat, we'll go with you before someone else because we don't want to take that in trade. I know you guys don't either. But um, that's how they, they source these. She'll pick. She'll pick items she knows that are upgradable. And also, too, mm -hmm. we're talking technology. She uses, I've seen her sell and I still sell goods because the video is clean or the picture is good or something she can sell on social media. She's, it was a two carat she sold on social media just because there was a little bit of help in technology. You know, so the fun. more that you aid them, my team, my staff, the more it helps. And those policies, I mean, they don't have to be like, again, that's where the relationship comes from. If, we're, if mm -hmm. we don't know the vendor, if we're willing to go out with vendor B or C that we're not used to, a policy does help so we know. So we know this is what happens, you know? And expectations, hey, if you sell it and you want payment in, in, in 24 hours, put it in there. Because mm -hmm. if we make, we need to jump. If, you, if, if you're pr providing the service, we need to meet the guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kevin, I think, um, I think in writing is, is definitely the best option. Um, we've actually implemented that on the retail side. We were kind of one of the few retailers on the, sh on 47th street to offer a printed money back guarantee in our bill of sale. And I know the consumers like that aspect and uh -huh. I know I would like to see that too from my, my wholesalers, you know, obviously if there's a well-established relationship and uh -huh. you know, if there's trust there, then it's not necessarily necessary, but it will definitely make us feel more comfortable, especially if we're just starting to cultivate that relationship. That's great. Excellent. All right, we are actually already at 44 minutes, so I would like to jump into the Q&A. All right, first question. Dylan, what was your number, what is your number one closing technique when the client walks away and goes a few feet to a competitor? Um, good question. Very good question. <laughs> um, really, as time has, has gone on, it's really been, I'm selling myself more than anything. It's a level of trust and comfort, reliability, personal relationship that I can offer. They can buy a diamond ring from anybody. Um, so it's really that connection that I'm selling and that's what I reinforce before they leave. And also the guarantees that we offer, which I touched upon, which is kind of rare for where I work. So that kind of sticks out. Right. You certainly have a lot backing you up besides your own personality and selling yourself. I think the fact that you have that established company and all those things certainly adds to your credibility. Excellent. Right. Um, for the retail panel, do you work with vendors that sell direct to consumers? Also, if they provide feeds to Blue Nile or James Allen? Um, I do. I, I, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Dylan, go ahead. Um, I do, sure. Um, you know, Blue Nile, we come across with all, often with our clients. And, okay. you know, sometimes you have to say no to clients, you know, as much you don't want to turn down potential business, but sometimes they're just not going to see eye to eye with you. So sometimes they should, they should go on Blue Nile and, and buy it from them. Um, other times we're able to offer expertise, offering the same stones as Blue Nile, but they get more than just a discount. They get us. So, right. you know, we're, we're okay to do that. I, I, as a retailer, I want to know it, it, it if I, if I have A and B and A is not selling direct, I'll choose A first because it's giving us a chance to, to support someone that chose us first. So if B does great business, we have a relationship and is selling a lot direct, it's harder for me. 
because uh, Dylan's in a place that's just so compact. I mean, I can't imagine doing business in your neighborhood. Oh. It, it, it'd be wild for me. Me, it's, you know, the kids' local soccer team and the, the university's band director in it. We're still very hometown feel. So mm-hmm. relationships, I have to support the ones that are supporting us. And I, and I pass that forward to our diamond buyers. Very interesting. Yeah. No, that comes up a lot. I mean, it comes up certainly for me when I'm, if I'm onboarding a new vendor and I'm asking about APIs, um, you know, are they willing to share an API? Then it, we get into that kind of conversation. Next question, Kevin, how different is business done in Canada than in the US, specifically memo items, um, stock terms, et cetera? Uh, no difference. I mean, uh, a retailer is a retailer, whether you're in the States or Canada or, you know, we're all trying to run a business and sell to the consumer. So, um, yeah, I guess it's, it's more geography, taking some time to understand where they are and understand, mm-hmm. say, Dylan's customer versus Jeff's customer and Robbie's customer. So, and whether we're a fit or not, but uh, mm-hmm. there's really no difference once those relationships are established and uh, we're connected. Um, you know, I, I've sent memo goods to a store in Japan and a few in uh, Austria okay. and, and a few in the States. So, I mean, once you get connected, I mean, it's, it's people are people. Uh, we're all kind of in the same industry and the same business. So uh, there's, there's no difference. I don't think about the memo international outside of North America very much. So I'm surprised to hear that, but it sounds like you had a good experience or you wouldn't continue doing it. Mm-hmm. Communication, right? That's the key. Of course. Of course. Um, all right. Next question. Um, let's see. I have one that I think is a little bit more political. Um, Nilesh, I understand you want me to ask it. I'm going to, pause for a few minutes because I think that one could go on for a little while. I think all of us could have an idea what the topic is. Um, Akshay, um, question for you. Moving forward after COVID-19, what percentage of diamond sales do you see going to online and retailers selling from home as opposed to brick and mortar stores? So definitely, uh... Post COVID, things are going to change. People are going to travel less, uh, meet people less. So uh, it will be every retailer's concern, and everyone has to think that any store also can have their own online presence. In like your, you know, we have come across mm-hmm. one uh, biggest Indian retailer. They have two thousand stores, so they are managing situation here by you know first of all fifteen days of sanitization. So. After post-COVID, the first thing I think as consumer, what they will need is psychological safety. They will not only, you know, they know that, okay, this brand or the store has the clean store, the staff is good, there is a social distancing Mm -hmm. maintained. So people will prefer where they have trust and, you know, a longer establishment. At the same time, these, uh, you know, as a retailer, if you have a loyal consumer for past 10 years, you can may go there and you know tell them okay you can select the designs online some jewelry online we can send someone at your place and show you 10 things at a time and you can choose from that so definitely we have to be extensive in our services post covid and in the way that they feel safe this is the most important thing i feel and it will change some dynamics of business what we have been doing now but uh, eventually human beings are fast learners and i think we will find a way uh, but yeah, no, to your question, definitely uh, it's not people want to go only online and shop. They want to buy from the trusted source, but online. They want to buy from the same store, but online. Not going to a different supplier who is uh, a retail, online e-retail. So mm-hmm. we need to change our strategies just to understand the mindset of consumers. But I think it's, it can be achieved. You don't foresee everything going online. No, it will go online, but to a people, those who, those them, they trust more. It's those, they have relationship or to connect as mm-hmm. Kevin and Jeff said that, you know, you know the person, okay? So I don't mind buying by, uh, from that person online, 
than going to the store but it does not mean that i will go to a e retailer and not to you mm. know my mm-hmm. person my mm-hmm. well i think that it, for all of us it's positive to see that we have a retailer on with us right now who is open actually the reason it looks like they're <laughs> um not in their store <laughs> is because um <laughs> they're actually in a hallway because they want to make sure that um we don't hear their staff while they're on this call because they are open so yeah. you know I, I think it's uh when we talk about is everything going to go to online you know looking at um robbie and jeff and their situation there in wichita falls texas texas is open for business right now um not completely but our retail stores are open um it is a good sign for us and i am anxious to hear you know this week and coming weeks how retailers like robbie and jeff are doing you know they're obviously seeing activity if they're worried that we're going to hear things going on in the store that's a great thing that means you already have people coming in and people are not afraid people want to come in and uh you know buy things for their loved one for that special moment those things are still happening and i'm hearing even outside the industry how people are going to be reaching out to um you know take advantage of those moments they've been waiting and waiting and they want to get married or maybe it's graduation and they've been waiting but they want to go to that local person and, and connect with them and you know maybe Robbie and they've bought from her before and they want to go back and they connect with her and they know she's going to help them so you know i think you're right akshay i think that it can't be a replacement the e-tail what well, what we're seeing is we've only been open you know since on and off really since a little bit before friday is mm-hmm. people are looking for normalcy. People are looking for, man, I can't wait for things to get back, you know? And I'm seeing, and I don't know, Texas is a rebellious country. So um, they wanna shake this off. Okay, we're done with this, let's get back to life. Let's get back to what things yeah. should be. And the, we'll see how that works, but yeah. people, people wanna connect. I mean, I, I see this might actually, Akshay does have a point about going back to to some going to online, but also I think people are more desperate for a connection. I want to see the person. I want to shake his hand again. I want to be able to, you know, make that deal. So I, I think it, it's going to change our retail a little bit, but mm-hmm. I, so far I'm not afraid of it. I, I'm excited for it. Yeah, and to add to that, the first opening we had, the mayor, you know, kind of jumped the gun. Our mayor jumped the gun for the Texas mm-hmm. governor. And so we all opened up like not knowing what it was going to be like. And he, he had mandatory masks. So we all had to wear masks. So we're mm-hmm. thinking, okay, yeah. we have to wear masks. We all had our personal hand sanitizer. We had alcohol spray yeah. to spray yeah. the jewelry down. And we didn't, you know, we didn't even know what to expect. So we were nervous. And then we were open for a couple of days and then shut down again because the governor. And then when we opened back up the second time, there was no mask requirement and people were coming in hugging everybody and they were just like so glad you're open and just excited and some of our staff that was really really nervous actually got back to business a lot quicker the public sets the tone you know they're setting the tone and we're trying to be sensitive either way because you got people all over the spectrum from Mm -hmm. they don't care to like don't ever leave home you know so you just have to kind of balance that but this is where you see your relationships really stand out yeah excellent now i have to say just talking to people this um uh, shoot the past month talking to whether it's a new supplier or people i've already um known and been working with i find that i can tell i'm chatty as i think everyone knows but i'm finding other people are also more chatty from home and i I think you're right it's that desire to connect however you can and i've actually found it refreshing to talk to my customers in a way that i find is even more genuine than usual and i think that the takeaway i hope is for all of us to um, step back and remember we're all people this isn't just about numbers and reinforce that the importance of relationships and what it really means to connect to someone 
Yeah. And I will say this, we worked a mm -hmm. little bit from home, reaching out to customers when we we're shut down mm -hmm. and our top salesperson, she, she casts wide clientele nets all the time. Just if you got a watch battery, she's probably going to text you. If you bought a one carry diamond, <laughs> she's probably going to text you. And she said through when we were, when we decided to reach out, we wanted to reach out more on a personal level and just say, how are you doing? because everyone's stuck at home and it was more from a care standpoint than we're trying to sell you something. And she said she got more responses just out of that instead of just being about jewelry or even if it's getting your ring cleaned or whatever. But mm -hmm. she said just when she checked in and said, I just want to check on you and see how you're doing. Are you surviving this? How's your family? Mm -hmm. And she got way more responses than normal. So I think that's the, that's what, that's what's been evident for me is about the relationships. Yep, definitely. Okay, next question. What more than a diamond can a supplier provide in order to add value to the business relationship? <laughs> okay, Akshay. Uh, so definitely we need to enhance consumers' experience and, you know, really understand them well in today's time, especially as we all agreed that, you know, technology has to be supportive and it's not destructive. And this is what we have done, that we have tried to develop a three-dimensional uh, machine where our online livestock is there. And these mm -hmm. machines can be put in the retail store. And actually a consumer can put their hand inside the machine and see the actual diamond, how it will look on their finger in the actual size. And then they can understand the dynamics of that particular diamond, which is located maybe in India or anywhere, but they mm -hmm. exactly know before it comes, uh, you know, so like, you know, it is an extension. It's like partnership. If we trust retailers, they carry the stock virtually maybe for 5,000 stones. So a consumer looking for a three carat radiant or a two and a half carat oval or five carat, everything we can provide with, you know, at the same time. So mm -hmm. today, you know, more than just calling on two stones on a memo, I think consumer can have with the help of technology, everything beforehand that how my diamond is going to look like. And that's who kind of solution we have been providing. And it's been really, really good. Maybe Ben can uh, describe it in a more better way because he's been dealing with that every day. Now you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> good. And, and Ashke is right. I mean, I think uh, helping the retailer have some tools to help sell and show off the diamond and help, uh, yeah. you know, the staff uh, sell diamonds. I think uh, diamonds need a little more... Uh, justice when it comes to selling in the showroom uh, and we too have created you know something to help a tool for the the staff and and the owners to help sell the diamonds show it off mm -hmm. and just be a lot more comfortable and confident in doing that um, and so yeah that's really important so providing um, sales tools I think um, opportunities for education or training um, you know I think we can also ask um, Dylan, Robbie, or Jeff, you know, what, what tools do you think are most important? What kind of support do you get from suppliers that you value the most? Yeah, that's a great question. I think depending upon the retailer, the tools will be different, but I know mm -hmm. for me, um, I think we specifically have a lot of opportunity on, on social media. We have a lot of our clients sending us pictures from our feed and saying, asking us questions about it. I'm looking to that for, for information. So, you know, one example could be a wholesaler taking pictures of a D color stone next to a G color stone next to an H color stone to see the color difference. They can do that mm -hmm. with a DS2, SI1, SI2. They can do that with some ovals with different ratios of length to width. Things like that are, are great information for our clients. Um, and will increase our business and in turn increase their business. Mm -hmm. Robbie or Jeff, what do you see as uh, tools? What do suppliers provide you? Yeah, you know what would be nice? And I used to have a guy that used to do this years ago. You, you're calling for a very kind of a specific uh, a carrot 20 marquee uh, GH SI one ish. They find what you're looking for, but if they get to know you, hey, I really mm -hmm. have this 
carrot 38 or I have this real spready uh, carrot 12 I like. Let me put something partner with it. Just not, I know what you're looking for, but give you another option. Because mm -hmm. typically if you're going to sell one, he don't care which one you sell, you're selling one of his goods. So if right. they know you and know what you're looking for, find a, a slightly different alternative. I know this one's 15% more, but let, I really like the make on it. Give us an option, you know, I'll send you the check and the stone back. So as they get to know you, they might know something. I know this is what you're asking for, but let me get you that and something. So I know it's not always easy on inventory to do that, but if you have something, it might be your, it might be your upsell a little bit. Right, right. I you're think it, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, yeah, Jeff, you're totally right. I mean, you know, to have, I think, I think you should always have more than one stone to show whether it's mm -hmm. one, from one supplier, one from another, or yeah, if you can get two or three, that's that's a great idea, and that's that's uh, that's always good to have a few more than just the one, right? I Absolutely. think this, well, it's like one will sell. Mm -hmm. right? I think it brings about a great point for all of us to remember, whether it's our retailers dealing with um, the end customer, or if it's the suppliers dealing with retailers, is that when you get a request, I think this is also sales that it's not about just listening and hearing exactly what the person said. It's understanding what they're looking for, what the real need is, because sometimes if they are requesting a specific item, um, offer more value. Anyone can literally transcribe what you just said and type that into a computer. It's yeah, really about providing that additional value and education. Um, you know, that goes along with you. And I think that's where we all provide value. And I think that's what, you know, ultimately gives us job security. I think that's one of my pet peeves with customer service is when someone just regurgitates what's what they're told to say and doesn't really think through and think about how to add value. And I think that's mm -hmm. really important for us all to remember, how can we do that? How can we really listen? Wonderful. Okay, so let's see. Next question here. Um, Robbie, how do you source colored gemstones? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sell them a diamond instead. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you I don't know, think anyone's I, here offended by that. <laughs> I think that, you know, right now, if you build a relationship, it really depends. I don't think I have a lot of requests for colored gemstones. I mean, I have more, you know, the feeling or they need a need and we just know our product in the store well. And we found a good mm -hmm. source for, for colored gemstone jewelry that we're really passionate about. So I haven't really had to outsource it that much. Oh, interesting. Okay. Very good. Um, all right, as a retailer, how often do you look to Facebook, Instagram, or other social media when looking for a new vendor or supplier or a stone your regular suppliers don't have? Hmm. You wanna go first, Dylan? Sure. <laughs> um, I would say I very rarely use social media platforms for that, I think. BDB is it's a great tool for that. I don't really need to look elsewhere for, for sources um, or just references through word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, I use social media really more to engage with, with my audience. Okay. I, Jeff I and Rob. Social, me social media doesn't give me that much of the inside of the company other than what just their social media person's putting out. So, um, not very much. I mean, I, I wouldn't go, if I'm looking for a vendor out of New York or wherever else, I'm not going to mm -hmm. probably check the Facebook page. <laughs> I think the, the wholesaler is better off creating that content and giving it to its retailers to then show off to the retailers, potential clients and clients, as opposed to, you know, spending money on outreach on their own social media platform. Hmm. Interesting. I think suppliers are going to start rethinking their social media. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Let's see here. Next question. Um, Akshay, do you think lab stones will be in high demand now since the economy is going down and people have 
basically people are looking for diamonds and don't have the same uh, spend that they used to. Do you think they'll consider lab grown as a viable alternative? Uh, to my opinion, I think it's uh, it's creating it. It's a it's again a you know additional business, and it is more cheap and cheerful for people who are taking entry points at diamond level. That you know there is a self purchase esteem and all they want to you know buy for themselves. They definitely is a new market for us. But when it comes to natural diamond, it's all about your valuing your relationship. So basically, it is not about the budget is less or more. When you want to gift uh, to someone who is very special after five years or ten years of relationship, mm -hmm. you will have your budget accordingly. You will buy. If you know you don't have budget, you might go for instead of two carat, you buy one point five carat or you know one carat to you know ninety point. But you know, I think when it's it's all about relationship and how pure and how natural it is. So diamond will not lose its value, but uh, it will be a parallel market. I cannot say that lab grown cannot do. Of course, uh, it is an additional, you know, uh, substitute. Uh, we cannot say that substitute, but it's an additional uh, market creation for, you know, people to wear more diamonds. So I don't see a direct, direct, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, exactly. So direct competition. Right. Okay. So another question uh, relating to the UK, um, they would like to understand um, shipping to the UK um, by the suppliers. Um, what cost do you cover? Do suppliers ship directly to the consumer on behalf of retailer if required? How do you make payment easy worldwide? So Kevin, you already said that you do memo out. Sorry, Benjamin, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of AML issues when you're drop shipping to um, consumers outside mm -hmm. of your respective country. Mm -hmm. uh, we generally will deal directly with that um, client and have a drop point, whether it be Malka Meat or a Brinks office, for mm -hmm. instance or directly to their store. So um, never been a practice of ours to drop ship to a, to a consumer. Um, so. Got it. Okay. Um, so we're getting down to a few last questions. Um, is there any innovation possible for jewelers to come up with during these times? How are we thinking outside the box? <laughs> we we took all our downtime and spent a lot on the training that you never have time for <laughs> so we That's we great. did that like I mean we did a lot of practice I think that um I felt like what you know I have little kids at home trying to teach and it didn't feel much different with staff <laughs> but just getting that you know practice out there and just it really got them comfortable because before all this, it always felt like, oh, I'll get to that, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. So the main thing I think is use this time, you know, to do that. And then, um, I don't know, what do you think? Well, as far as what I've seen is during this, they found new ways to hit people up, selling by text, paying by text <laughs> messenger, uh, by pay by text method, uh, show stones uh, via Instagram and messenger. You ha we have to use social media to touch people we couldn't get to face to face. So yeah, I think that yeah. was a big deal and they were innovative on it. You know, they, they got creative. We, we were making sales, you know. You know, our store was shut down, but we were videoing a bunch of jewelry, you know, and you put it on social media and people, they rather buy with you than Amazon or, you know, a company mm -hmm. they yeah. don't know. And I did, Instead of our company Facebook page, because it seems like Facebook has so much weird controls on who sees what, I did it on my personal, and then they did it on their personal, and that's, I actually sold a two carat to somebody that lived two hours away just from posting a video of it, so you, you know, you don't, you don't know until you try, and you just do it for fun, you know, it will, people will engage. We did a lot of live Facebook, too, which is a little improv, <laughs> so 
you do some do some of that and it just makes people feel connected still because that's the one thing I was afraid of. We have so much relationships that we work hard at for clientele and you can't wait for people to walk in the door anymore. You have to reach out to them. And the more you do that and the more you don't lose that connection in this downtime, the better. So. Yeah. No, very true. Dylan, what about you? Um, yeah, to kind of piggyback, piggyback off what Robbie and Jeff were saying, um, just using innovations to make it easier for the clients. So make your website nicer, more aesthetically pleasing, easier to navigate or creating mm -hmm. an app, create one with VDB. We've also implemented, um, they can chat with us on the website. We can facilitate mm -hmm. a sale that way. Or if they just have a question, they don't have to email us or find our Instagram and direct message us. Just from the website, they can say, hey, I have a question about this running and you can keep them engaged and keep communications live. I think mm -hmm. that's the other I think too, like checking up on their anniversaries and birthdays because if, if you have a birthday or anniversary and you're stuck at home, things are a little bit more, maybe a little more turmoil because you've been around each other so much. <laughs> so if you say, if you can use that to your advantage in a good way and just say, let me help you. We even did offered free shipping in our own city, you know, like mm -hmm. I'll ship it to you, you know, I'll deliver it on your porch, porch step, you know, like I'll watch you grab it, what, whatever you have to do. <laughs> The easier you make it, the better, because everybody didn't know what to expect through all this. So the feelings are still there. Mm. Birthdays still happen. Anniversaries still happen. You know, if anything, they probably need to happen more when they're stuck <laughs> at home. <laughs> so it's <laughs> one thing. We just touch base. Hey, if you need me, great. If you don't, I just want to make sure you're okay and you know I'm here for you. Mother's Day is coming up this weekend, and I did a lot of personalized jewelry sales with a company called Jack Figler and he takes footprints of babies and handprints and he does signatures and mm -hmm. I sold probably about eight guys for their wives and they didn't even have to come in the store because everything wow. was via text you know they sent mm -hmm. their baby's awesome. footprint to me they did you know all their kids signatures mm -hmm. and you know just try to make it like where they don't have to worry about it that's you know, they don't even them. realize that Mother's Day is here. They were just now allowed to go to the <laughs> store and buy flowers, you know? So just being there. That's that's what's important, you know, making yourself known. I always say that about radio. That was their, like, takeaway, even though a lot of people don't use a lot of radio or, you know, there's mm -hmm. XM mm -hmm. and all that. You know, the radio stations, they told me a long time ago, be, kn be known before you're needed. And that's my goal is just to know I'm there, you know? Yep, yeah, absolutely. That's great. That's good. Um, so one other question before I get to the, um, the more political one. Um, <laughs> from, um, from Nilesh, um, he wants to know whether you quote net price to the consumer or percent off of a benchmark. I can, I can maybe speak to that a bit. Um, okay. I try to make the barrier for the retailer as easy as possible. So I think at the end of the day, you, you know, you need to know the price, you add your margin, you, you have to show it to your customer. So I always say price for the stone. And if I can help with the exchange rate in that exchange mm -hmm. rate, um, mm -hmm. there's no price for carrot. There's no wrap price, no nothing. Uh, I figured you just need to know that, you know, final price for that stone and what you need to then, you know, uh, speak to your customer about. And that seems to, from my, my experience from the retailers I work with, um, seems to work for them. Okay. Anyone else want to add on that? Okay. I think there's a, there's, there's a potential risk when you're priced per carat and it's a carat six or, you know, a 92 pointer and you just missed that. Was it price per carat or is it price per stone? Telling people how much the stone is just cleans it up. The stone's 28.50, the stone's 48.50, boom. It's clear, no mistakes. Right on. All right, so do you see a positive future for all of us without a wrap list? <laughs> and I would like to bear in mind, this is a very positive and respectful conversation. Um, 
But yeah, I, I mean, I, it's come up a lot. Uh, I will say that VDB took discounts off because discount off what? We wanted to make sure, you know, the purpose is to make sure there's agreement and it makes it easier to trade. And at this point, we haven't found agreement. Um, Tanya sent out a survey to our members and asked, what do you want? Do you want us to um, use the list? What list do you want? Do you prefer not to have one? And I would say out of the feedback that we got, we actually had quite a few say they didn't want to have one. Um, but I would love to hear what each of you say. I can, I can go ahead first because I don't use it. 99% uh, of my retailers are not asking me about uh, wrap discount. So I don't use it with them. It doesn't factor into my buying. I think a lot of what we've all talked about is relationship, talking to people, have the relationship mm -hmm. between the retailer supplier. Um, you can go on VDB, you can check out 10 different carat F color SI2s and you can see the cheapest stone and the expensive stone and, and then determine you know, who the supplier is. You can determine the, uh, the quality of the stone. There's so many differences within one grading anyways. Uh, so for me, uh, we never adopted it. Adopted it. Uh, it mm -hmm. never was a factor in my buying or my selling. Um, so, and it hasn't uh, inhibited us in sales or anything like that. Um, uh, you know, I think I, the price is tells you everything about a diamond. If it's cheaper, there's a reason for that. If it's more expensive, there's a reason for that. And that's been my kind of philosophy and, and, uh, so far, I, I think it's working unless someone tells me otherwise. All right. Who else would like to offer their input? Oh, silence. Robbie and Jeff, do you, do you use it? I, I'm, I do a little. And, and the only reason why is sometimes benchmarking does help. If I have a customer really heavy looking at a and a an, uh, carat 50 LVDS1 emerald cut, or should they go to a carat 48 GSI1? So looking at wrap and benchmarking and looking and comparing does give me some footprint on pricing. I don't discuss it with clients. I don't discuss it. Mm -hmm. If they come in, I want something 20 back of wrap. I said, well, go to a used car lot, you know? <laughs> uh, so I don't know what to tell them. So it does give it does give a benchmark, but I don't think the universe is going to collapse without it. All right. Yeah, and and to be, that, oh, sorry, Don. Oh no, no, I'm just saying it will be interesting to see how the narrative changes. You know, we even have clients sometimes come to us and ask us what the discount is. So it it will be interesting to see how the narrative changes, and hopefully, it will change in a way that is more dependent upon relationships and you know hey dylan i need a stone you know can you find me the right one as opposed to mm -hmm. hey this guy gave me a gsi one for 30 back can you beat that which is yeah, oh. business. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah so hopefully it will deter a lot of those people um or at least change the narrative so those people can look more into what's important and that's relationship yeah and, and, to, and to a bigger topic on, you know, just our industry as a whole, and of course, I'm very much natural diamonds, that's, that's our business, is um, not sure many other industries talk about a product like diamonds with a discount. Just seems mm -hmm. a discount, the word discount and diamonds just should not go together. Um, and I don't know if that, you know, uh, builds into the psyche of our industry, but I think we kind of have to get away from that. I mean, we have a luxury product signifying a very important part in someone's commitment to mm -hmm. each other. Uh, and we're talking about discounts. Uh, I mean, go to the flea market if you want to talk discounts. Um, we're talking about something very important, something very natural for a natural relationship. And so, I mean, that's, that's kind of, uh, it's not trying to be negative about the rap. Uh, it's just, uh, but then again, I do understand Jeff's point, you know, uh, somehow understanding that, that benchmark. So, We'll see how it's used. The silence, um, from, the silence from Venus G is not uh, <laughs> in an either way. <laughs> I, I'm getting questions specifically saying, Akshay, what do you think? <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> you, you know where I stand, so. Go for it. All that. <laughs> so, uh, definitely the 
you know, discounting and very well said, first of all, Kevin, that, you know, we are in luxury goods and we are really mm-hmm. dealing with pressure, rare stones. And, you know, it does not sound correct when we talk about just discounts and how much back and all. It's not like a big manufacturing wholesale business. And it's, it's a spe- very specific and special product and it's limited product. So I agree with that. And this is just a, you know, lately it has been, in everyone's mind because it's kind of language, but ultimately it does not matter. You know, the consumer are dealing only with total value. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, wholesalers are, when they are selling to retailers, they also do a total value. So it's just the mindset which people need to change and understand, okay, be used to do this kind of business 10 years back also, 20 years back also. And that time it was more healthy, right? Now, what has happened to psychological people say, oh, this is not 20 back. Oh, but this is stone is rare. They, they forget that. It has to be 30 back or it has to be, you know, 35 back. It's a mindset. So I'm mm-hmm. sure people understand that now much more in recent times and they mm-hmm. really feel, is it required or not? And people are asking, you know, themselves that, you know, you know, really this, you know, discounting system is required and I'm sure people understand we can definitely do a business of carrot and total value that's that so many times we have done business from india and then the report changes on friday and then they say oh our total value was this much and it changed this much and back so mm-hmm. i'm sure people will realize now more to oh, do the basics and work on the okay all right, so, so um, I, I thought think we... people will. Sorry, actually, I don't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, no, I thought it was cut out, so I don't know, you could not hear me or something. But, anyways, people, I'm sure, will be happy to work more on total value and per capita than the back. I do think that there's there's something to the psychology of using the word discount all the time that does. I don't know how it can impact you psychologically when you're talking about a product you value and appreciating the product you touch and deal with every day and you say discount all the time. I think that that's a contradiction. And um, so from my perspective, I really think there's a lot to Kevin, what you said when you talk about, we, we sell a luxury product. I can't imagine Louis Vuitton, Cartier, and others walking around talking mm-hmm. about discount. Mm-hmm. So I think we have to value what we do. And again, the words we use matter. And if we're saying it over and over again every day, you know, it, it's, it cannot help but seep into our psychology. Um, I've heard just this, recently, I was just mm-hmm. going to say, I heard just recently that they said, we don't sell diamonds, love does. <laughs> So there it's you just go. a feeling, you know? There's no love in discount. We don't talk about discount. <laughs> we say how much I love you or... Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. So we, um, as much as I, I wanted to keep it on time, we are over. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. It's been a wonderful discussion. And I'd like to give our panelists an opportunity to just to say a few words to wrap up and say, Bye to everyone. Who starts? Bobby and Jeff. I'll go in order. <laughs> okay, well, well, thanks for letting us be a part of something like this because we're ready to get moving forward in business. We're excited about what's coming ahead of us. Um, someone asked me a question if we're going to be here, you know, a customer. Being in business 130 years, we're looking forward to the next 130. If we don't base our sales and our event and one transaction, on its own, we're having to think of the big picture. What we're doing as a retailer, our relationships with wholesalers, we have to be a big picture people, and I'm excited. I'm excited about our future. So it, the landscape's gonna change a little bit, but I'm okay with that. So I'm ready for what's going. If you have good people and good product and care about people, that's what's gonna work. So I feel that. Yeah, don't lose your passion, you know, through this time, don't lose your passion. Just keep it going. Kevin, would you like to add? Yeah, well, I, I want to thank VDB for this this setup. I mean, um, and a few other panels that you've done. And I mean, during this time has been 
you know, unfortunate, but fortunate to, I've never been so connected with, you know, so many other uh, dealers, other manufacturers, other retailers, and, and to have a discussion like this and people chiming in. I saw the one last week as well. And uh, it's, it's just great to, to be connected. And, and I can't see how we cannot be better after this. Uh, you know, there's no way. I mean, unless you're not doing anything right now, you know, sorry, but I mean, uh, I just can't see how we can't all, all be uh, stronger, better, more connected. And, and I think, you know, we'll see the importance of how, you know, we love our technology, but nothing will ever replace uh, human face-to-face -face, um, mm -hmm. connections. And so I think we'll really thrive after this and, and, uh, and make sure that everyone, I mean, I think make sure you get involved with your, uh, you know, your local groups and jewelry associations. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's very vital um, moving forward. Excellent. Benjamin. Oh, wow. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's great. It's great to get the feedback from the retailers and, um, you know, just positive vibes for everybody in this world to get over this and get on with life. Thank you. Dylan. Uh, yeah, thank you, VDB. This is a great topic of discussion. Um, I think it can really serve as a catalyst for wholesalers and retailers to really personalize a bit more. You know, meet for breakfast, meet for coffee, spend mm -hmm. some more time with each other, get to know each other more, understand what our, you know, hard points are so we can better serve each other. You know, we all are people at the end of the day. Very true. All right, and Akshay, sir. Yeah, it's been the greatest platform. I mean, really a great initiative and really, uh, you know, we never think and talk and understand each other's perspective. So this was actually the time where we got connected and we understand from retail side also that what are their requirements and what they feel about that, what they have to be. Treated. So it's, it's a great connection. And I mm -hmm. think uh, we all will definitely pass on this time soon and get back uh, with much more solid and stronger grounds. So thank you for everything. Excellent. Thank all of you. Thank everyone for um, sticking with us and listening through the entire webinar. We really appreciate your feedback and feel free to reach out to me. Um, we'll also have emails for everyone who's joined today, all the panelists. So if you have questions or want to connect with any of them directly, you may do so. We'll be happy to facilitate that if needed. Thanks again. And I really hope the takeaway here is how important relationships are, communication, and that we actually can come out of this much stronger and much more connected. Wishing everyone a great week. Thank you. Thanks, Kara. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.